Hey everyone, let's talk about series and shunt stubs. Now you remember from our previous lectures, we had this idea of lumped element matching. And in particular, in particular, we introduced this notion of, I guess how you say, the L section matching network, right? So you had some piece of transmission line coming in. This might have had a characteristic impedance Z sub zero, Z naught. And then I could have the high low configuration, which would then match to a load like so. So this would be Z sub L, this might be JB. So that was my susceptance, my susceptance a shunt susceptance. And then I would do JX here. So you might call this um, you know, a high low network or equivalently, or I guess not equivalently, but slightly differently, you could do the low high version like the following. So you have the shunt first and then you go in series and then we have our load over here. Okay, so this was the low high configuration. This was my JB for my susceptance. And then this would be some JX and a ZL. Uh, so sorry, I didn't quite draw them <laughs> symmetrically there. That's okay. Uh, so remember, there, there are certain practical limitations to constructing a matching network using these th this sort of thought process, right? So I might have a capacitor here with an inductor over here, or maybe I'll have a shunt capacitor with some series inductance here. And according to the textbook, this is a good rule of thumb, this really doesn't work so well when frequency gets above about a gigahertz. That's because lumped elements like inductors and capacitors uh, they, they don't act like ideal inductors and capacitors anymore. They start getting a bunch of parasitics and they're very hard to control. So your matching properties just don't work so well when you get very, very high in frequency. So for that reason, it's much, much more common uh, to use stubs instead, where they're just simple lengths of transmission line. So let's do kind of an analog here. Um, I guess they're not quite analogous, I should say, but they are, they, there are the same idea where there's two varieties of stubs. So the way stub matching works is you first have a little piece of transmission line. So this is going to be my load again, and this could be complex, remember. So just, just a reminder, ZL is going to be R sub L plus JX sub L. So there's some load uh, resistance and load reactance in this little load impedance here. And when you do stub matching, the first thing you have is some length of transmission line. I'm going to give this a length D. Okay. And after that, you have what's called a stub. And it might look something like this. So let's see if I can draw this. So I'm going to go down like so here. So, so I'm going over my D like that. So let, let, let's uh, redraw this. I'll put a, my D over here, just ignore that. And this has a impedance Z naught here, Z naught coming in, feeding this. And this guy here has some length L. Okay, so it's just sort of breaking off in parallel. So this is why this is called a shunt stub. Okay, so you have a series length and then this shunt, meaning sort of this parallel branch coming off of the transmission line. The parallel to this, uh, so I'm going to move this a little bit over here, will instead do something like this. So, so we have that same length D to my load over here. Sorry, I didn't quite draw this uh, ideally. Let me just do this here. So that's the shunt stubs and this variation here. So you see the, the top signal line, you break it and then you have a little piece of it going in parallel. <clears throat> so this is called the series stub instead. And again, this length here is going to be D and then this length here is going to be L. So what is the difference between these two? So um, intuitively, I think it makes sense to start with this and then look at this over here. So the question is, what is the equivalent input impedance looking down this little branch here where it's connected in parallel? And, the way, and all you have to do is break this up into two little pieces. First, I'm going to draw this here, looking into this series little length of line. I'm going to call that, say, Z in 1, and I'll draw that in green. And then down here, I have another input, Z in 2. So I hope you can kind of see that, right? So where it branches, I have 
one equivalent input impedance looking down into this branch, and then there's another equivalent impedance looking down into this branch. And hypothetically, I could even terminate this with some load, right? But the, the two most common cases are open circuit and short circuit, because it wouldn't make much sense to actually attach another load here. Uh, so you can either just leave it open or you can imagine shorting it. And both cases will, will kind of have parallel behaviors depending on the length of this line. So forgive the little scribbling there. But the idea is the equivalent input impedance looking down this little parallel branch is just the parallel combination of those two uh, lines. So I would say Z in is just one over Z in one plus one over Z in two. And then you just do one over that. So that's the idea of the shunt stub. The total input impedance looking down here is the parallel combination of these two. And remember, there is the equivalent uh, transmission line impedance equation from your book, which if we, if we go all the way back <laughs> to chapter two, is uh, this, this equation down here. Let's see if we can find it. Here we are. It's uh, this equation here represents the input impedance looking down both of those branches. So we have that transmission line impedance equation that we would plug in here for both Z in one and Z in two. <clears throat> now by analogy, the series stub is going to be series, right? So that, that same idea is gonna apply. There is some equivalent input impedance here, Z in, uh, I'm gonna call that Z in one. Sorry, I got my colors mixed match. And then you look over here, there is an input, input impedance, Z in uh, two, like that. So this is a transmission line. There's an equivalent input impedance here. Or you can imagine looking at this way and going in that direction, say, <clears throat> they'll be the same idea. And it's not intuitively obvious, but because it's a series sub, the equivalent input impedance, Z in, is just the series combination of these two. So you'd say Z in one plus Z in two, like that. Okay, so that, that's mathematically the series stub versus the shunt stub. Uh, so this configuration, however, mathematically is gonna be a little bit easier to think about, but practically speaking, it's not the greatest thing in the world. Um, and you know, cause again, we, we could terminate this with an open or short circuit, uh, but practically this is very difficult to do, especially with something like microstrip lines. And you can see how this configuration actually lends itself very neatly to microstrip. Because I have my main transmission line here. Here's my load, it's just a resistor. You see there's some length D here, and it just branches off with this little parallel line going down the other way. So the shunt stub configuration is very, very practical, but there's a little bit of extra mathematical complexity you have to think about in order to make it work. If I were to do a series stub here, you would have to imagine, say, I take this little piece of transmission line, I break it, then I have two pieces kind of <laughs> coming up like this. And you can see how that would be wildly impractical on this sort of planar configuration. Uh, so those are our two types of stub networks, uh, the series here and the shunt. This one is a little bit mathematically easier to visualize and work with, but this one is actually far more practical. So what we're gonna do is explore this one first, and then we'll look at this one second.